We have an action-packed panel today. Folks I've known for at least, well, Carolyn I just met today, but most of the folks I've, I've known for quite some time. And they tell me that there's no question that can stop them. So uh, it's the usual suspects of, C of CIOs. This question of getting started with open source is ever present. Last year, the um, GOSCON 05, a number of the CIOs and um, IT staff attended. And, and what they were trying to do is really understand what open source was all about. You know, most open source doesn't get in the standards list. Most open source comes in the back door through members of the technical staff simply downloading it because they have an admin rights and it's because they want some software that they can actually do their job by. I had this uh, presented to me firsthand at ODOT where I, I asked my managers um, well, how much open source do we have here? Well, we got this mainframe Linux in, uh, environment for the driver's uh, application. We got some Linux servers over here and, and uh, maybe in one or two of the development tools. And so I said, well, wait a minute. That, this, this is a mixed response. Maybe I need to do a network scan, check all my PCs, check all my servers based on what Gartner is saying uh, is the latest in terms of the maturity of open source products and really see what's out there. I found, I discovered about 5,000 instances of open source product. That's product based on known product names. Some were the same, some were different, some were unique. And so this question of getting started with open source is crucial because typically we don't know that we've already started. So who do we have lined up for a panel today? We have Andy Stein. Andy Stein is the director of IT for the city of Newport News, Virginia, and champions the adoption of open source processes in government. Andy, Andy worked at Capital One as data center manager and in the IBM consulting practice. That's Andy Stein. Bill Welty, Bill was actually presenting yesterday, Bill Welty is the chief information officer for the California Air Resources Board, the ARB. He also serves the state as the lead of the California Open Source Working Group. The ARB has standardized on open source some 65% of its 45 systems and data models run on Linux. 67% of its database systems use LAMP. 89% of the web applications rely on Apache. We just heard about Apache upstairs. Challenging global warming requires that the ARB think in terms of worldwide collaboration and what better way than via open code. Kurt Patterson is the Vice Provost for the Information Services and Information uh, and, and CIO for the Oregon State University and Oregon University System. During the last nine years of Information Services, he, his organization has reorganized, improved, and expanded services and continues to build toward a sound infrastructure for the Oregon State University research, teaching, and learning. Over the past few years, Kurt has supported the open source movement, making the Oregon State University Open Source Lab, OSL, a focal point for collaboration and innovation in open source software development. Next up, next up is Carolyn Young. Carolyn Young is the Executive Director of Communications and Technology for TriMet. In this position, she is responsible for marketing customer service, organization development, and the information technology departments. She coordinates several special projects, including TriMet strategic planning and sustainability programs. Before coming to TriMet, Young was Communications Director for the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, where she worked for 13 years. And finally, Bill Kroll is the CIO for the Oregon Department of Human Services and has a rich background in, in helping large, complex organizations address their information technology needs. He has served as Chief Information Officer or in other senior positions with major companies in the pharmaceuticals, publishing, healthcare, and other industries. These include publisher McGraw-Hill, Teva Pharmaceuticals, North America, and Meredith Corp, a large media company whose products include Better Homes and Garden and other magazines, as well as blocks and consumer websites. So I think we've got a great panel 
for discussion here. And we've actually organized a number of questions. But Andy has a proposition for you first. Andy? <laughs> Are you surprised? Well, I wanted to um, kind of start off this conversation with uh, the following point that there are several ways to start with open source. One way is do nothing. The other way is do something. Either way, you're going to start with open source. If you do nothing, it's a grassroots technology. As Ben indicated, people will start downloading things, and you just find out that things have happened to you, and you have open source. Another way is you do something. And that's what I'm going to propose, that you do something. And the something is the open CD. I have a few here that I'm going to give out to those who will ask questions today. Free as in beer, not as in speech. This is free as in beer. It's a software that is packed with good stuff that runs on Windows, so you don't have to be a Linux uh, uh, geek to use this stuff. It runs all on Windows. Open Office, GIMP, a lot of good stuff. And it's nicely packaged, easy to use. Now, what's great about this really is that instead of your employees downloading this at work and playing with all kinds of stuff and you're kind of out of control, you're getting more in control. And you say, here are the things I would like for you to play with. But you know what? Play with it at home. You can put it on as many pieces at home <laughs> as you like. Learn up Open Office on your own time. Come in here, and then you know Open Office. And you can, of course, use it at work as well. But start at home first. So free CDs to all those who ask questions. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. OK. I got a question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, this panel is really wired, folks. Okay, so Andy, here's, here's the first question, since you're, you're, you're wanting to provoke the audience and all. Why and when did your organization first consider getting started with open source software? Why is it me again? So, <laughs> um, well, look, I, I came into this open source world without really knowing much about open source. I, I started with this about four years ago with a big problem I had to solve that I thought I cannot solve it except if I use some collaborative means. So I was looking for for best practices in collaboration. So part of that research kind of led me to, well, here is open source. That's a best practice in collaboration. Why can't we do that? So then the more I looked into it, wow, this, this product is neat, this product is neat. But really, what I embrace more than anything is a process of how this software is built. And that's really what I'm trying to leverage more than the product. Although there's a lot of open source product we use in my organization today. We did not start with a product focus. We started with a process focus. Bill, what, what about you? Let's give you that same question. Do you want us to stand or? Uh, uh, you if you'd like to stand, feel free. <laughs> Getting old. Um, well, we go back about 1994, and uh, I, I think it was more along the lines of if you do nothing, it happens anyway. And uh, uh, we had, had a unit of, of engineers and uh, programmers that were working together, and they liked the internet. They worked with super, uh, San Diego supercomputers, so they were doing a lot of things on the internet anyway. And they came across Red Hat, and they went out and bought a manual. It cost them fifty dollars in the back. Flap was a CD. They put it in, and uh, they found they could do a lot for nothing. And uh, all of a sudden, we just basically began to build on that because the budget was right, the technology was right. And uh, what I really liked about it, uh, for the most part, is the team built team building quality that it offered for that particular unit. And when I looked at the units, the ones that were using commercial products versus the ones using open source, there's a lot more esprit de corps with the ones that were working with open source. And we really like that from a you know, social work environment. And so we capitalized on that. Okay. Kurt, you want to have that, that one question? I, I can. Started? Before, before I do that, I'll tell a little bit about what and when. In the back of the room, Shay Dake and the director is sitting back there. And a lot of people during the conference have said, what do you do, Shay? Do you work for Deb? Do you, do you want, she actually is the director that that was responsible for the open source lab. She does things like budget, sets priority, holds people accountable, uh, but doesn't take credit. So Deb and I have become very visible after Scott and Jason have left the open source lab. But there's the person that's actually done all the hard work. I just thought I'd, I'd recognize her. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the what and when is kind of interesting, because we were early adopters of tools that helped us better manage the web, better manage the network, better manage. We picked the low-hanging fruit the spam, all the things that everybody else was doing. And it was in 2003 when somebody came along and said, we'd like you to host two Gen 2 Linux servers and help the community. Well, we couldn't say no. That was not a big deal. Well, it became a big deal now, what, it's three years later, and we host close to 200 servers. 
and 50 of the largest community-based open source projects in the world. So you, we moved very quickly along that spectrum and our whole role changed from one of using tools to manage infrastructure to hosting, distributing, and developing open source. Okay, all right. Carolyn? When I uh, came to the IT department at TriMet about three years ago, um, we were using a lot of open source on the back end. Um, our server guys wanted Linux and hated Windows. Um, <laughs> but it, about that time, those of you who are in the Portland area might be familiar with um, an application called Transit Tracker. And this provides uh, um, real-time arrival uh, times for all of our trains and, and buses at about 8,000 stops around the region. Um, we were um, pioneering in this uh, technology and putting transit tracker signs out on the street. Um, and then we decided, well, this is something that um, most, a lot of our riders could get um, a lot faster if we uh, put it, made it available by cell phone, because we could only put a few signs out on the street. So uh, we wrote an application to um, provide real-time um, information by cell phone. And that um, application was extremely popular. We're, we, we get about 400,000 calls a month now for that. Um, we were getting calls from other transit properties all over the country saying, how'd you do it? Um, you know, can we have it? Can you share it? About that same time, we got a lawsuit um, from, from a company that said that, you know, that they had uh, the patent on arrival time information. Um, so that's kind of how we got into this arena. Um, but what we did was uh, talk to our lawyers um, and, uh, and decide that um, even though there was a lot of risk in this area, we wanted to start talking with other transit properties. And we wanted, because we were developing a lot of things at TriMet that we thought other people would want, not just Transit Tracker. And, and we thought, well, they're probably developing things we want. So uh, we went to the national um, uh, convention for transit uh, uh, for technology for transit agencies uh, two years ago and we um, invited people to get together with us for dinner and kind of start talking about this and um, as a result you know a lot of things happened and now we have a track a transit track at this conference so it, it really was because our um, software developers um, were into open source and um, uh, wanted to use it and also wanted to play with, with other people. So uh, what's really taken it to the next level for us, because we're still struggling um, through this, um, trying to get um, other transit properties to, to, uh, to work with us, um, but what's really pushed it to the next level is our relationship with Google, which everybody's hearing about next door. And um, eight months ago, um, Google went live with Google Transit and Portland was the only transit property uh, on Google Transit for eight months. Now there's a few others that have joined. But um, again, that caused such a ripple. Uh, we got calls from all over the world saying, you know, how'd you do this? How'd you work with Google? Can we, can we do it? Um, so it, we're, that's really how we um, got started. And, and um, you know, and, and you know the rest of the story. Now we have a track at, at this conference and we want to take it to the next level. Okay. Well, not to be undone, what about DHS, Bill Kroll? Thank you, Ben. Well, I would say that, that open source and, and Department of Human Services is really coming from three different directions. Uh, the first would be bottom-up. Uh, similar to your organization, we've discovered uh, a lot of use of open source. Unlike yours, it's all well documented. And <laughs> <clears throat> Got, got people back there right now creating files, paper files of how we acquired it and the like. But that's no, it's simply uh, the best bill. Hold yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it, a lot of bottom up, and in fact, one major success with uh, Sugar CRM last year, which I talked about at the conference, which uh, you know was a, was the first real application we brought in specifically to meet um, you know a pressing need in the agency, and we're able to to get up and running pretty quickly. So we, we've got a lot of that going on. Um, second, uh, the second probably really dates back to maybe almost 18 months ago when I probably first went down to Open Source Lab and met uh, Kurt and went to IBM and went to OSDL. And I was fascinated at the idea of the business model around open source communities and community development and, and a 
and how that might apply not only within Oregon but nationally on how we go about developing uh, human services applications. As many of you may know, because uh, of federal funding, all of the applications generally that we develop are already in the public domain. But, but we as states haven't come together in a community to really enhance those and make them you know, this big rather than a lot of little things out there throughout the country. So I'm interested in that. I'll, I'm working to try to see if we can get APHSA, uh, which is the American Public Health, Public Human Services Associations, backing to, to have a national symposium, hopefully here in Oregon, on that very question. Okay. And, and I think a lot of what we've heard from the speakers in this, in this uh, conference can add a lot of weight to the fact that this, this is real. It could happen. It just, just takes our intent. And then I think the third way it's coming at us is, uh, is through the Oregon Open Source Community of Practice, and it's kind of the horizontal side of this, starting to look at, at uh, how can open source be applied in government, and I think there's a lot of opportunities there, and maybe we'll get to them as, re as we pursue this discussion. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Let's, let's go back to focus on that business and strategy question. And Bill uh, Welty, I want to I start with you on this one. Where does open source software fit into your business and technology strategy versus tactical? Well, at, at the um, Air Board, uh, since we've been doing this since about 1994, uh, the perspective of the, of the IT shop and the IT things that we do is that it's a can-do shop uh, without constraints and everything is open and there's lots of uh, participation. Um, and they expect that we can do things very quickly. So strategically speaking, th there's, there's very little patience for procurement cycles and things like that. So the minute that somebody has an idea, and yesterday I talked about the, the um, the recent passage of AB 32, which will put ARB kind of like in a leadership position uh, for global warming, the idea is we want you to begin to collect data today. We want you to begin to deliver uh, a marketing system in a couple of years. And so it's, it's like the procurement cycle would have or could uh, basically delay a lot of our, um, uh, a lot of our activity. But with open source, uh, we're good to go today with design, uh, with, with that whole development process. And that's just part of the strategic thinking by the executive staff is that uh, uh, that whole pro procurement piece uh, is missing yes. or is gone. So there's really an expectation that's being built into how you're delivering code in terms of um, agility, quickness, being able to respond fast with what your business is requiring. Well, absolutely. And, and there's the other piece of it is the whole collaboration piece where uh, there's a culture within the Air Resources Board where the users and the IT, people, IT staff basically blend. It's the, the separa there really isn't a separation there. And uh, so strategically speaking, uh, everybody knows that when a project starts, they're all going to come to the table. And that the lines are really blurred in that regard. Okay. Uh, panel, who else would like to speak to that issue of strategy? Kurt? I, I can very quickly. The interesting thing when I left state government after a career as a bureaucrat and I became an academic without credentials and wandered into that environment. I learned a lot about what a land-grant university is. We have extension agents all over the counties and their goal is to provide service and outreach to help people. I used to think that extension agents, the ones I knew, would look at bugs I had on a flower and I thought they worked on cows. And That was about my, my extent of thinking that we were... But no, it goes far beyond that. They do a lot of work in poverty, they do a lot of work in underserved communities and the way we got our university president on board, who you heard from in the kickoff, was talking about his thing is, what is a 21st century land grant university? Mm -hmm. And I said, we would reach out to the world and we would make a difference. Well, we've made a difference in the International AIDS Vaccine Project, okay. which uses our help desk. So in Africa and India and other parts of the world, they're using a tool that's making a difference. The other one is, is we're partnering with One Economy, they're the people that put the technology and the broadband wiring into the habitat for humanity homes. Mm -hmm. And we're working with them on how can you use open source software, drive down the cost of the technology. Also, uh, one laptop per child movement, things like that. It not only makes the people working on that feel good, but it really does 
connect with our outreach and service mission. Internally, it's things like getting students engaged, uh, having them be part of it, having the faculty see research opportunities. The toughest part has been getting the deans, these tenured deans that sort of, this is the way our college has been in some cases since 1868, and it's gonna be this way till 2068. And now you're walking in, knocking on my door, saying we ought to be doing something in this area of open source. Well, it doesn't necessarily always fit their agenda. We're making some headway. Okay, okay. Let me ask the audience, and I'm gonna pick up the wireless on this one. Anyone making that transition from tactical to strategy around open source? I'd like to tell us about what you're doing. Anyone making that transition from tactical to more of a strategic intent behind use of open source? Yeah, this, this, this is your time for that CD. No takers? Andy, let's go back to you. Well, when I think about um, strategy and open source software, if you look at internally to my organization, we use open source software. Uh, I'm not sure I can call it strategic yet. Um, our website will be all open source starting in February, and we will give that software away. And if I'm able to build a community around it where two years down the road, some enhancements will come from all these 20, 30, 40 others that are using the website, then it becomes strategic. But I think that uh, the it becomes more strategic, the concept of collaboration, and open source enables that. Uh, at the talk at 1115, we will talk a lot more about ecosystems, and, and I will point out that you can have open source software applications without necessarily building it on open source platforms. So open source does not necessarily mean it's built on PHP. It could be built on PHP, but it could also be built on .NET. And there are examples right now of taxation software, for example, that is being shared as, as open source, but it's a .NET application, and it's just fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. New question. How is a collaborative development model a compelling reason to use open source software? Collaborative development model. Carolyn? Well, I think uh, more people often improves the product. Um, for us, in terms of our, our um, strategy, we've, we've got um, uh, developers who are open source believers, um, true believers, maybe even fanatics. Um, but we've, we've adopted a policy that um, whenever there's a, a problem and it needs a technology solution, that we'll look at open source first to see if there's um, an open source a solution that fits um, before we decide um, to buy proprietary software. In the transit industry, there's not much out there in terms of uh, competition um, from, uh, from in terms of the software vendors. Um, it's just a small industry. There's, uh, there's only two or three vendors, and um, in some areas, they can really hold us hostage. Uh, so we'd love to um, find solutions that we can develop or that we can develop collaboratively. Um, one of the things that we've done is uh, decide, uh, we decided to develop an open source solution ourselves and see if we can get other transit properties uh, to join um, with us uh, because we think that only improves it. And we, um, we demoed that yesterday. It's a, a schedule writer. Um, we, we have all these schedules that you have to uh, translate into something that people can read, um, either on paper or online. And um, so we put that out yesterday. And what we're saying is, you know, take a look at this, um, work with us, help us improve it. And I think it's it, the the biggest benefit is the collaborative um, effort that can go into improving things. And um, you know, wish us luck for really hoping that this works. Thanks, Carolyn. Bill Kroll, you, you've recently implemented Sugar CRM over at DHS. We had a little bit of a discussion at breakfast this morning around this collaborative approach to where CRMs usually are in the private sector versus where we'd like to see them in, on the government side. you have any comments on that? Yeah, I, I was thinking about this question when you asked it, and I think, I think where we are in the human services community and probably pretty much in state government, maybe across the board right now, is, uh, is very, there are those of us 
who are up here visionary, hopefully seeing the future, seeing the possibilities. One of the great values of this particular conference is that we get these really solid people who've actually done it, who've actually, uh, you know, like Brian this morning, and, and, you know, and so we can get information about how do you create a collaborative uh, environment. I, I asked the question this morning about the ground rules. What is, how does this work, you know? And just hearing them describe it is, is I mean, truly fascinating. And you can see that, uh, you know, that, that, it, that it can work. I, th I think one of the key things about open source, by the way, is not, is not release 1.0 of whatever thing it is that, that's being done, but that the idea that there is an infrastructure and governance process that people adopt that assure that that technology is, is maintained, supported, enhanced, uh, controlled in terms of quality assurance, et cetera. That's, that's been the thing to me that, that really, uh, really differentiates it from other kinds of collaborative efforts that have gone, in, you know, gone forward in the past is that we haven't built that community that, that has that sense of responsibility, that has that function and goal to, you know, and process in place. And, and there are different processes, as we've learned. Eclipse is different than OSDL, is different than XYZ. They've, mm -hmm. they've uh, pretty much uh, adjusted based on what makes sense in their, their environment. That, that's what really kind of blows me away as the CIO, because I think the last thing any of us want to be associated with is is when we retire, which for me is not going to be that much longer. And and somebody says, well, you know, we're we're out there replacing all of the legacy systems that Bill developed, <laughs> or implemented, oversaw, and uh, and I think this provides a vehicle for avoiding that. And here's our first winner. Yes. <laughs> Make note of that, Andy. Yeah, yes. uh, and uh, being exposed to you know, open source through uh, the GOSCON conference, you know, it appears that these collaborative groups in the open source community of interest is uh, essentially made up of IT professionals uh, and programmers. Now, my question is, are, are we approaching the tipping point, or do you see the tipping point where uh, open source is not going to be not viewed as an out-of-the-box solution, but that you're actually beginning to see some pull demand for open source solutions from end users themselves? Thanks, Chris. Anyone want to take that <laughs> I'm going to have to fake this one. Um, yeah, you got your city, right? Well, if, if I may just, I would like to tie that question back to what was asked here, because it's basically the same uh, side of the same question, which was uh, whether uh, open source software, whether collaborative development model is a reason to use open source software. And I say it is and it isn't. It is because, um, because, because open, using open source software um, has a mindset of collaboration. Those who use open source software trust the value of the community. But as I indicated before, you can build open source applications with proprietary software just as well. So how are we going to reach that tipping point where uh, the demand will increase for this kind of collaboratives? I, I think that um, it's a management decision, in my, in my opinion. And I, I've done a lot of thinking about this. How do you start these collaboratives? You know, you could hope that the developers from the bottom up, grassroots, as the open source community started it, that's how we're going to develop business applications. I don't think that's the case. In my opinion, it's going to be uh, senior management people up here and others in the audience who have some decision-making power in the organization. I think we need champions for these bigger projects. Somebody who has a vision to say, I'm not going to build this application one more time in a silo mode like uh, Brian Bechlendorf uh, indicated this morning, but I'm going to build it with this concept in mind that we will share. So I think it's going to have, have to come top down, not bottom up. <laughs> That's just my opinion. Oh, great. We have more questions and more CDs. <laughs> oh, the eyes is coming alive. My question is regarding, you know, the getting started. It is coming from grassroots, but at what point does IT engage, like the chair, the you know, the commissioners or, you know, the mayor? Do we get our act together and kind of start managing it and then present it, or do we try to go up to the top at the beginning to get their support? I mean, 
what time is the appropriate time to bring the CEO of your organization into it? Well, there's, in my view, in my experience at Airboard is um, there's different ways of governance and different ways to lead. And uh, so we, it's, in, in my view, it's been very adaptive. So on one hand, you can come in and say, this is the way the world's going to work with IT. And we're going to run it this way. We're going to buy these products. We're going to standardize on these things. And that's what you do. With open source, it, it works a little bit differently, where to some degree, you're like the guy that says, which way are they going? Because I got to lead them. OK, and with the airboard, there's a certain amount of that because we're largely engineers. And uh, like I was said, that if you don't do something, something's going to happen anyway. Uh, and we began to find that <clears throat> Linux was a very powerful tool and the price was right and the performance was excellent. Uh, it, was, it was time to more or less to get ahead of it, but not necessarily to say this is ours and this is what our standards are going to be. Uh, so we, we basically have a concept of leading from behind. All right. We know where we want to go and there's, a, there's also this notion of herding cats. Okay. And, to the, and we can measure our success by uh, not in, in days and weeks, but more of a strategic sort of way where the organization goes the direction we want to go in, but we didn't necessarily have to get it there out in front. Okay? So we basically keep uh, a very watchful eye on what users are doing, what projects are moving forward, what tools they're beginning to use, and then we basically capitalize it and make it part of our overall standard, our overall strategy. So it's not like jump out in front. But it's more like you go back to the collaborative model, which is everybody's, everybody's part of this thing. And it, is, it, and it works dynamically. We run our website very much the same way. Content management is decentralized. We have like 250 people that contribute to the website. We run about 250,000 pages. And uh, we're looking forward to this kind of a model for doing environmental things, say, worldwide, as we begin to go into this global warming thing. I don't want to beat that to death. but. It is going to work the same way. And like I mentioned yesterday, if we were to come in with commercial solutions for that particular uh, effort, it, it would undermine the effort because we put up artificial barriers to participation in trying to find solutions for uh, global warming. I, I sir, definitely agree with that leading from behind concept. I think that's really important, especially in government. Um, we shouldn't be out there on the bleeding edge. Um, just uh, the thought, um, uh, from my experience anyway, is that um, I think the answer to your question on when do you take it up and who do you take it to is that it's de it depends. Um, often um, we've got uh, people in the, the leadership positions, whether it's a board of directors or the CEO, um, um, who frankly, you know, can barely open their email. And um, taking them, you know, the open source concept is not something that they want to spend the time and the effort or can really understand. So you got to figure out how to take it to them and in what, um, how to describe it um, in terms that they can understand. And bottom line issues are terms that, that they can understand. Um, so um, we've, we would never take that subject to the TriMet Board of Directors. They just, you know, IT's the black box, got you know, 45 people in it, they do okay. I don't want to know about it unless it breaks. Um, so you've, I think you really have to, to figure out what's the best effort, uh, what, what's the best time and, and how to do that. Um, for our CEO who um, uh, is you know, one of those people that can barely open his email, um, he does understand the concept of collaboration and that, um, and that the vendors are very difficult for us to, in the transit industry to deal with and that we've only got a couple of vendors out there um, uh, and that proprietary uh, software that we can't look at, we can't go fix. We're really held hostage um, to when they're available to work with us and they get that. Um, and so if we can relate it to the business problem, um, I think then we can be successful in, 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 letting, in helping them understand what we're talking about. I think it's a great question, and and maybe would be a great theme for next year's Goscano Seven, leading you know leading open source from the top, uh, and we can get some of these great speakers we've had to go to things like the National Governors Associations and and start to educate 
Because I think the, the fact is most governors, I know most directors of agencies, don't really have much of a clue what, what this means in a sense. And, and we need, to, you know, I think it's a challenge to the CIOs that we need to get out there and, and educate our leadership. I can just imagine, you know, 50 directors of human services in a meeting and, and this topic comes up of child welfare and they find out, well, I'm spending $40 million to get a new system. And then somebody else says, well, I'm spending 80 million. And New York, it's big, says I'm spending 200 million. And they all say, well, gee, don't, you know, this is kind of the same thing, isn't it? They all kind of shake their head, you know, and, and they say, gee, you know, you're not trying to create a better system to steal all those people from my state, are you? And the guy says, no, 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 I really don't want to do that. <clears throat> so, so, you know, and, and, then, and then have them come to the realization, well, there may, there may be a better way to do this through an open source community and, and see how, and, and then know that that's a reality, that that could happen. Just very briefly, I also think it's a great, great question. Uh, I wrestled with this for so long, you know, when do I take it to the mayor? When does a mayor need to know about this open source thing? And why should he care? And I think that if you are just an open source producer, I mean um, consumer, you just download and use, who cares? You save a buck here, a buck there, pay, pay a buck in training, it all washes out. But if you're a producer, if you really want to do collaboration, that means you are a producer, which means I'm going to take the intellectual property from my constituents, basically, and give it away. And now I understand from my legal, at least, that in my organization, this needs to go up to the mayor. The mayor has to sign off on my right to give away software in, on the GPL format. So I had a compelling reason to educate my mayor about this, and my mayor understands this concept of collaboration and where we're going, and it's a strategic thing. But otherwise, if you just talk products, the mayor couldn't care less, or the CEO in that case. Uh, a couple of hands go up here. Thanks, Andy. Question? Uh, I, <clears throat> I think this is similar. Um, we, we were talking, my coworkers and I, this morning about um, at, at what point, like, if we're, if we're internal to our organization, we're in, in Multnomah County, and it, it makes it difficult for, for management, you know, in IT and otherwise, to kind of sell the concept that we're going to, um, our, our staff are going to contribute to a, an open source collaboration project. You know, individually, it's tough for us to sell that concept. Um, but one of the things that kind of has been spinning in, in my mind, and it's similar to what we are just talking about, is, is can we get to the point where we're we're looking at this as a social con contract with citizens. Um, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of organizations that, that want smaller government and more efficient government and all these things. Well, this is one way to get there in this collaboration and saying, you know, rather than us, indiv us individually having to sell it, you know, that, that it's worthwhile to, s to spend this, but actually coming from a public relations standpoint and, and um, government saying, we're going to spend 5% of our resources, for example, on collaboration with other governmental entities because the sum is greater than the, you know, the, the sum is greater than the parts. And, um, and I, th I think if you can get citizen, dri you know, citizen dr driver on that as well, um, I think it's going to be a lot easier to, to get there. It's just another tack. It's another strategic angle. I don't know if you have some thoughts about that, if there has, a has already been some thinking about that. You talk about social contracts. This isn't communism we're talking about, is it? <laughs> well, let, 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 let the far right talk to you about that. Uh, I, I took that approach and I, I tried it. And, and I said, how do I even explain this to citizens? How do I get citizens involved now? I mean, I have a hard time getting my peers in government involved. And that's just. That's a few of us, you know, and explain, I've been explaining this to my peers in government for years, and, and I really don't get much traction. Now I deal with this, all the citizens, how to explain it to them. So I thought, how about if I start with the open source, the local open source users group? And they are now my citizens that could come and beat at my mayor's door. I want that. And I went and I spoke to them. Not one knock on the door. So it's a great concept. <laughs> I like the idea, but I don't know how to get it going. If anybody has ideas, but I was just going to say, politically in Oregon, we we got in front of the Joint Legislative Committee on Information Management and Technology, and we gave a presentation, and you couldn't tell 
you know, did they understand what we were talking about? We ran in and ran out. Well, two of the state senators, Frank Morris and David Nelson, said, I'm not completely sure what you were talking about, but when we, can we come down to the OSL for a day? And they met students, they met the president, they met the provost, they, everybody talked about what we were doing in open source. And then they left and they said, we need to figure out some kind of legislative push we can put in here. Same thing happened with the governor. The more he knew about what we were doing, the more supportive he became. And then David Nelson, senator from Pendleton, calls and he said, I'm going to meet with the Pacific Northwest Economic Region in Whistler, BC. Do you want to come up and help me educate my colleagues from the legislature from all over the Northwest and BC on open source and what the opportunities are? So I, it's sort of organic and it grows at the bottom, it grows at the top. The thing that influenced the senators the most was the students and what they described in terms of their career opportunities, what they were learning you know, how they were auditing some of the engineering and computer science classes based on the work they were doing in the lab because what they had in their textbook wasn't relevant. And uh, they listened to that and some of them are leaving and earning three times more than what a normal public employee would learn, you know, even at the university because they're getting great opportunities from a career standpoint. And people relate to that. More questions from the audience? You get those CDs ready, Andy. I work for a uh, state agency, and it seems to me like there's a paradigm shift that has to go on when you are dealing with vendor-related products for a long time. You know, we've got Oracle, and we've got all the big, um, you know, products out there that we've been using for years, I and mean, there's a big investment in time and money over years. But aside from that, there's the IT infrastructure where they've got individual programmers who are working on their own individual products and own individual projects for various groups. So even if you say, okay, from the top down, we're gonna say we're gonna go open source and we wanna collaborate, how do, you, how do you shift that paradigm from not just we're gonna collaborate, but from you have to share projects now and you have to develop, you know, along a schedule that's mutually agreeable. I mean, it's, it seems to me like there's more than, it's not that simple to just say we want to embrace open source. Who wants to take that one? Go ahead. You have the mic. Oh. <laughs> you, you want to just speak? Because I got a couple yeah, questions. Uh, it doesn't happen quickly. <clears throat> And we've been at it for, you know, what, 12 years. And uh, we're just beginning to point where 67% of the application been cut over to open source. We still have ways to go. And my guess is it's going to go on for years and years. And so what happens is people are going to retire. And what I'm looking for when I hire people is not just their technical skills, but now their social skills. And so basically there really is the shift that goes with the workforce itself. And, uh, uh, and it does come bottom up and it does come top down. I know that one of the things that really put uh, California on the road to open source when the state CIO came out about two years ago, and he basically said, we don't want to miss this. If this is a, an IT wave that has traction, we want to be part of it because there could be great competition benefits, great price safety benefits, and performance, all those kind of things. And so that's kind of like why we jumped on this thing. If, if, if open source didn't have traction, we could always just back out. Uh, so it does take a top-down presence to come through. <clears throat> but I think you have to look at it sociologically and say, you know, how old are these guys that are, that are providing the risk that are uh, having resistance? And then what is that rate of change going to be over time? And then you begin to look at those systems as you put that into your strategic plan. That's kind of what we're doing. As these guys retire, we move their systems from DB2, let's say, in a real case, over to minus 12, and the people coming through don't know any different as transparent to you. Sounds like almost a stakeholder analysis plan to figure out who's on board, who's not, and how to action. Yeah. Andy? I'm not sure if you realize this, but the question you asked is really what we discussed this morning. You're going from silo to ecosystem. It's really the crux of what's going on. And I still believe that it's a top down thing. This is not going to happen. The top has the top, I mean, CIO, the director of IT, has to set the strategy. 
to say, I'm not building any more silos unless I must. I always first look at, do I have an opportunity to collaborate? Let's look at best practices, what others need. But you also point out something extremely important in this collaboration. It's so hard to get multiple organizations on the same schedule to agree on, you know, across organizational boundaries, let's do something together on, on this schedule and on this budget. It just doesn't happen easily. So what we need is, is more the open source style of one champion or maybe two who say, you're gonna put up the money. You know, this is a government project I'm working on. I'm doing it on, on my own. There's no other organization involved. I'm gonna release it as GPF. So I'm not trying to synchronize my needs with other localities only because I could never get to that end. So I'll just create my version of it and put it out. So if it's a champion, just like, you know, Line of store, what's going Linux, and anything else. You can start with somebody putting it out there, and then if it's good, it evolves and it lives, otherwise it dies. Here's a, here's a question from Steve Morris from, from the Open Technology Business Center. Great. Not, uh, not even in government, so I'll have to speak as a taxpayer. Um, at Bill Crowell, I think one of the, the comments you made is, uh, if I heard it right, was that uh, software development uh, developed by a state agency is, is a public domain type asset. Um, so I wanted to make sure I heard that right, and if I did, is there in some sense, as a, as a tax-funded uh, entity, uh, if this material is in the public domain, do you in some sense have a mandate uh, to provide it to the public, to make it accessible by the public, and are in fact there, there are mechanisms uh, to do that, uh, which of course is a side comment, is, is kind of what an open source approach would do, and is that yet another rationale to, to put uh, government-developed software into more of a, an open source model. I, I think, Thanks, Steve. I, I think it is in an open source model. Uh, a little bit of background of that, about that. The reason it's in the public domain is because that is a requirement of the federal government when we get federal funds that support our major systems initiatives. So, and that can range from 50% federally funded to 90%. We're doing a new managed uh, Medicaid management information system and it's 90% federal funded. Now, the way it works in today's ecosystem, which is not so good, is that, um, is that we're actually implementing the Oklahoma system that was developed by EDS and, uh, and has gone to four or five other states. Uh, but there is no ecosystem among the states to maintain that system or some of the other systems that are out there. So, so if you went to Oklahoma and then you go look at Oregon, Oregon's system is going to be based on their system, but is not going to be the same system because we'll make changes and modifications to meet Oregon law and the way we do business and some other reasons. And that, that to me, the hope here is that if we, if we really realize that this is already in the public domain, is already open source, and we can get the states to collectively agree to not only pick the best one out there in child welfare, MMIS, uh, hospital management, uh, public health, or whatever, uh, that we build the community, the, the ecosystem, the structure uh, around that to, to make sure that it's maintained and supported and enhanced and upgraded when a new technology appears that, that uh, hasn't been a part of what's been uh, developed to date. That's the challenge, is to form that community. Or the alternative in Oregon is it's Proposition 85 and we just work on the term, terminology, make it law. Well, this is in uh, direct uh, relationship to the 80-20 rule that I've been reading about in the literature where you develop the open source software uh, to, for the core 80 percent. 80% of the software is the core of what all of your members need. And then that last 20% is the customization that an Oregon might need or Rhode Island or, or, or so forth. More hands? More questions? No. The question that I have is kind of combining some of the comments I've heard from the panel. I really like Bill's visualization of the 50 heads of agencies that are from the same, uh, you know, all human service agencies meeting and talking. And what Kurt said about uh, educating the legislators, is it possible that the OSL or some entity might be able to make it a program 
to identify those gatherings because they do take place and to offer an outreach to go and educate at that level uh, what collaborative development is all about and I know that that would really benefit me <laughs> to have it start you know as Andy's been saying from the top down uh, and and then bring it to to my level we'd like to take that one I think that's a very good idea and we, we haven't done enough we individually do a lot like I'll go somewhere and I'll hear stories come up and then we'll meet you know, Steve Morris you know, sometimes we're together often we're not we have a little bit different stories but it's all about open and learning it's all about open technology open software the benefits and, and the people talking to all around Kool-Aid but oftentimes, the, and the audiences we speak to have also taken their first drink. But, but it's difficult sometimes to get in these settings, but more and more opportunities. I think we can encourage a lot of those. People are interested because they've read about it, they've heard about it, someone's told them about it, they, they read Friedman's book. I mean, something has sort of triggered them to say there's some curiosity. And I, I think that's a good idea to sort of put together something where it's an it's a open source overview for not for dummies, but for politicians or decision makers or people at the top. I so said the, the governor was a pretty easy mark because he saw the political advantage of adopting open technologies in Oregon. But on the other hand, he meets with Steve Ballmer and says, best tool for the job. And we do that too. I mean, we, we, it isn't a competition. It is the best tool for the job. How do you get the mentality up there? There should be more choice. And there should be more choice in government. My, reason for focusing on government and going to Bill Crowell and my colleagues and joining the CIO lines, it had to do with being a state CIO at a time when things were very proprietary, but it also had to do with the legal department that says, Kurt, you keep trying to partner with people. Private-public partnerships suck. They never work very well, and they take you two years to get through the Department of Justice. So why would you do another one? You say that if you work with government, Kurt, you can do a memorandum of understanding, you can do a handshake, it's a much easier, go to nonprofits and go to government, but stay away from some of these private sector things you're doing because you get into competition issues and everything else. So that sort of led, but now that we're there, we can do a much better job. I know a, a couple of legislators who said, why are you doing this? And I said, because we can do more, we can do it better, we can do it faster and cheaper. Now those are things that you should be interested in. <laughs> Thanks, Kurt. Elise? Well, I think mine is more of the same, but I, I have a uh, question about the follow-on. You, you bring the open source in. Do you, at that point, make the conscious decision that you're going to participate in the wider group and contribute to those? And if you do, then how much time does that take? How do you, how do you set up that infrastructure? How do you go to your customers and say, okay, now I have X amount of time where some, some of your re the resources you're paying for are going to be contributing to this bigger group, and, and how do you how do you set that all up so the expectations are um, reasonable? I'll come back very briefly to start, and that is remember when you join an open source community and become a contributor, you're not starting from you, they're not giving you a blank sheet of paper and saying go out and create you know or something. Uh, we were just talking uh, this morning, actually, with Sugar, with this uh, re uh, relationship manager software, and been talking to Sugar about it. That that it wouldn't it be great if there was a government version of Sugar. Sugar is built for, you know, customers and sales pitches, and and when when we put it into state government, we took all that stuff out, and we put in providers and partners and you know who we deal with in relationship. And, uh, you know, so, so we're actually going to work with them and we're going to give them, you know, kind of the government instance of Sugar CRM that they can throw up on their website, we'll contribute back. Not a big deal for us. We had to do that when we did it ourselves. So I, I think that's an important thing to, rec to remember. It's, it's almost, a, I would think, a natural uh, part of you know, being engaged in the community is that you're going to see something, you're going to make a change, and you're going to say, hey, that might help, help everybody and give it to them. So it's not really extra, so to speak. Also, very briefly, I'd like to <laughs> address this issue. Um, 
Apache is an example. You know, I have a lot of esteem for Brian and all that, but I doubt that my organization, while we were heavy users of, of Apache, will ever submit an enhancement to it. We won't do it. We are not that deep into Apache. We are users of it. If you find a bug, however, we will report it, so that's going to be our contribution. Hey, guys, there's a problem here. You know, I'll tell you about it. On the opposite end, if we, and we're looking at Sugar, we're also using Plone and some other more business-related uh, pieces of open source. To the extent to which we already add value for our own need, we will then package it and make it available to that community and give it back to the community. But there is no requirement and no need to uh, add value to every single product used in the open source. Here's the proposition. We talk about open source. We're talking about either being in a community development initiative or we are simply adopting software that's in the marketplace. And so when you look at the software that's out there today, here's what Gartner is showing as their current stack and how it grows up in terms of the maturity level of open source software that's available. And sure, some of them have you know, four and five stars out here, but others are still pretty immature. Even we talk about Sugar CRM, it's got a one star, but it's doing what Bill's organization needs it to do. And I'm not sure if they've ever, ever gone back and tried to give them ideas in terms of changing it. Maybe you have. Questions on that? Or any question? I saw a couple. Kurt, you had a question. OK, Kurt and then. I mean, Ben, that uh, maturity chart's interesting. and, and uh, State government, probably publicly funded entities, by definition, are risk, risk adverse. Uh, and someone mentioned not wanting to be on the bleeding edge of uh, adoption. Um, so how do we balance that? And even if we rolled in the the uh, security question, uh, you know, the, uh, how do we control uh, uh, and and make sure that the investments are uh, are protecting the data, protecting uh, the access controls, and that that we're uh, investing in properly matured products and and secure products so that the the environment uh, still maintains the public trust that that we're responsible for. Bill? Well, just briefly, I think that, that question applies to any software and not unique to commercial or open source. And uh, the thing that we like about open source <laughs> The thing we like about open source is that if we find a product that, that is attractive to us, that we're interested in, uh, it doesn't cost us anything or cost us very little to bring it in, set it up, test it, run it, go through the, the battery of tests you might want to for all those purposes, um, and we can either reject it or accept it. If you, if you go down the commercial path, you typically end up having to buy something first, run it, test it, and if you reject it, Okay, then you've got a problem because you've already got an investment, so you're less likely to, so you tend to be, typically end up living with what you've got and try to build around it. So open source offers this great opportunity to, in a sense, protect yourself before you commit. Actually, I think uh, Ward Cunningham had a slide yesterday, if I'm not, I think that's who I'll attribute it to, but he said the beauty of open source is the cost of failure is very small. And that's really, really important. You know, if we, if sugar had been a total failure, eh, I got nothing in it. So, you know, it's no worse than I would have been without it. So I think, quite frankly, Kurt, to your point, this may provide an opportunity. That's maybe why we will be leaders in this, is we are so averse to risk. But this, this really takes a lot of risk out of the equation. I think that's a very important question, so I would like to address it also that, um, um, you know, there's a trusted source. When you buy proprietary software, you go to trusted source. And this is a barrier I find in government to say, what is this stuff I download? And uh, who is behind this stuff? And if I get in trouble, you know, who do I go after? So the, the fact is this, that, that for that mindset, the answer is there is commercial open source software available. So if you want to have the peace of mind that this open source stuff you're using is 
certified, stable, security things addressed, go to a trusted source. Red Hat, Novell, Spike Source. Now, Spike Source does a great job, by the way, and I have no investment in Spike Source. Just I discovered them recently. A great job in just packaging this, this different product stacks together and offer them to you as a service. So there are ways for you to get that certification that what you're buying is kind of tight. And there's support. You know, it's called commercial open source. I wanna, Otherwise, you have to do a little more homework to make sure what you're downloading is right. I want to pass the mic to Carol there because I've got a question for her. We have about, we have about five minutes. Um, and the question really is, what, what role does IT management play versus members of the technical staff in terms of open source? And here's, here's what I had alluded to uh, when I first opened the, uh, the meeting today. This is what I discovered when I did my network scan of software tools, <coughs> software product that's being used in ODOT's environment. Now, that's more of a comprehensive look, but it's not, it's not there because management brought it in the door. It's there because members of the technical staff downloaded it because they needed it to do their jobs. Yeah, we've implemented Linux, and management knew about that. And there may be some t development tools that we've implemented because management knew about it. But that's over 5,000 hits, instances of open source. Most of us, we don't know what we have in our environments until we do a scan of, like this. So Carolyn, wh what role does management and members of the technical staff have in this? Yeah, excellent question. I think it relates to some things that we've been talking about earlier. Um, I, in at TriMet, I, th I think we've, uh, the, as management team, um, decided that open source is the way we're going to go. But that doesn't mean that we don't understand that there's some risks in doing that. And um, we've been working with our legal department to understand legal risks because when you get a lawsuit, you start understanding that. And um, there are legal risks, and we haven't we haven't really talked about uh, those today. But um, you know, if you uh, you can't develop your, uh, you know, your software on top of proprietary software and give away proprietary code. Um, you know, it's that simple. And we, we wanted to make sure that our developers understood that, so we spent some time with our lawyers and, and uh, the developers and tried to, to talk about that. But um, uh, I'm sure if we, if we did this comprehensive scan, I'd find a lot more than, than you did, and probably all of the same things. Um, but at the same time, I think we've tried to work with our developers uh, to understand um, how to appropriately use um, open source software, and um, and you know, and I think they do. But it it kind of relates back to the topic that we've been discussing about: does this does the drive toward open source come from the top down or from the bottom up? And I think this is an illustration that it really is both, and that if from, it is going to come from the bottom up because there's developers who are going to stumble onto this stuff and they're going to like it and they're going to want to collaborate and um, they're going to do it. Um, but I think as managers, um, you know, what, what I want to do is provide that environment for them to be creative and be collaborative, but at the same time um, make sure that, that they, we understand what we're doing and what we're getting into. Well, we're going to close out today. Uh, oh, one last question? Okay. In the movement from bottom up, from the developers up, I sort of see a sort of circle argument about the support issue, that when development does want or proposes an open source solution, um, either you get the argument that proprietary software has much better support than you could find in open source, or that there's no willingness in your organization to start developing an open source base to do your own support. So how do you address that? Very quick, I just want to say, uh, as I indicated before, there is such thing as commercial open source. This argument that open source means no support is simply false. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean that for every single open source product you can get robust uh, support for. That's not the case. 
So you need to do your homework before you would create such a, such a platform to say, where will you get support from? So as long as you do that homework and you, you demonstrate that you can get support, I, I think that you will be ahead of that, 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 that you do need to 